Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, here to the Forum of Hydrogen and Fuel Cells Europe and Hannover Messe 2023. Welcome again to the panel discussion, Next Generation Electrolyzers in Flagship Project H2 Giga. Green hydrogen, ladies and gentlemen, and that means uh, climate-friendly hydrogen, can only be produced with electrolyzers, fed with renewable energy. And even though this technology is over 220 years old, Electrolyzers are still manufactured by hand today. Can you imagine? This is extremely time consuming and also very error prone. So to be able to produce green hydrogen economically, we need large capacities of efficient and cost effective electrolyzers. And we also might need a complete new technology for the next generation of uh, electrolyzers. This is what we want to discuss the next 40 minutes with my panel and with you, and here are my guests. Right next to me is Dr. Isabel Kundler. She's a Senior Advisor Electrochemistry at Dechema and contact person for the flagship project H2 Giga. Welcome here on stage. We have Sebastian Kopp, he is Research Associate at Fraunhofer Ise. Also welcome to you. I welcome Dr. Holger Eisenlohr, Chief yeah. Engineer at Enapter, and opposite of me, Dr. Frank Meyer Petrov, Head of Components and Modules, R&D, Hydrogen, Scheffler. My name is Ulrich Walter. I'll be your moderator for the next 40 minutes. And uh, whenever you have a question, just raise your hand. I'll be with the microphone right with you. Ms. Kundler, um, let's uh, start um, with a project, a flagship project, H2 Giga. It is uh, um, installed by the Federal Ministry of Education and Research uh, with the aim to support the research for mass produ production of electrolyzers for the production and scale-up of hydrogen. Dechema is coordinating the electrolyzers pr technology platform in the H2 Giga lead project. So tell us a little bit more about what activities are going on in this project. Yes, thank you very much. H2 Giga is uh, one of the three flagship projects of the Federal Ministry um, of Research and Education. And, uh, and uh, H2 Giga aims to industrialize electrolyzers and to develop technologies for mass production, for serious, serial production of electrolyzers. So in general, H2 Giga has three sections. One of them is a scale-up section where the established electrolyzer manufacturers in uh, the Germans uh, 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 um, uh, industrializing their technology. And uh, the, the uh, second section is the next generation electrolyzer section where uh, highly inno innovative um, technologies are uh, developed and scaled up and or, or new players um, are developing that uh, technology. And additionally, we are uh, also a research project and we have a large innovation pool and uh, there are more academic projects um, uh, who work on, uh, on, on important questions such as material development or testing or life, lifetime testing and lifetime parameters. Dr. Kundler, it's interesting that it's the Ministry of, of Education and Research who is supporting yep. uh, all yep. this, this, this kind of research. We could also think, well, scaling up production is a, is a topic for the uh, Ministry of Economics, but uh, <coughs> there's a, a, a highlight on the research part, isn't it? Yes, it is, indeed. Uh, um, Scale-up is uh, yeah, very close to economy. However, we, we need new technologies. We have to redesign a lot. Even, even the large suppliers um, are still assembling uh, their stacks in uh, more or less manufacturing uh, um, uh, work. And in order to, to ramp up the electrolyzer's capacity, and to, to meet the goals of, uh, let us say, 5 or 10 gigawatts or even more in, in 2030, um, we uh, need serial production. And we therefore need also a certain redesign of the core components in order to make them suitable for serial production. Dr. Bayer Petrov, uh, everybody knows Scheffler as an automotive yeah. supplier. Very few people know that you have an industrial uh, division focusing on future fields like robotics, wind power, and hydrogen from electrolyzers. Um, wh what, what part does it play in your company and, and, uh, of Scheffler 
the industrial part? Is it just uh, like a new business div division or uh, is it uh, uh, equal to the automotive supplier part? Uh, thanks for raising this question. Um, the industrial sector does play a huge part in the company Scheffler, Scheffler Technologies. Uh, the industrial sector is somewhere in between a fourth and a third of the whole business. So as you say, uh, we are mostly known for uh, or being an automotive supplier, but we, um, we are mostly known really for providing roller bearings. Roller, also journal bearings, sliding bearings, but mostly roller bearings, which of course are being used in the industrial sector or, uh, um, as well. And thinking of renewable energy, for example, uh, if you look at all the big wind power plants, you will find our bearings in each and every one of those plants. And probably this uh, area will, will grow in the future, hopefully grow, because uh, probably the automotive sector will, will uh, shrink uh, what we, we can probably expect by e-mobility. Yes, but then again, e-mobility is also a big field of, um, of profession uh, of our business. Um, we are, um, we're big in e-mobility and uh, talking about hydrogen, we also develop all kinds um, of uh, devices for the like hydrogen. Like systems, don't yes, you? Yes, exactly. From component to the stack to the overall system in fuel cells. And um, we even built, um, uh, we call them uh, learning platforms, which actually can be looked at here at our booth, at our joint booth. There's a joint booth. Joint means that uh, we have industrial applications and automotive applications on display here at the uh, Hanover Fair. Dr. Mayer Petrov, uh, one of the projects Schaeffler is involved in is called Stack Scale Up, um, co short Stacy, uh, um, industrializing PEM electrolyzers. Uh, what exactly are you doing there? Yeah, you're right. Uh, Stack uh, Scale Up, Stacy, is part of uh, the next generation Scale Up um, sub project in H2 Giga. And we are the leader of a consortium. Um, of 11 project partners aiming to develop technologies, components, and stacks, as well as the industrialization of such. I would say Schaeffler could that do, do that on their own, but uh, you're, you're, uh, you're within the project HU Giga. What does HU Giga help you? Giving money? <laughs> well, there has been a, a lot of projects uh, on, on a German level, on European scale, but obviously what's been missing so far is the industrial breakthrough, the game changer. And we all know these days, just listening to the, to the radio, to, to the news, we need that game changer and we need it now. We don't need it in the 1930s or 40s, we need it exactly now. And so it is wise to have a very common approach, a joint approach to bundle all the competencies there are, and there are a lot, fortunately, and to, to now ramp up, scale up, and have that game changer in place. And, and have you any, any results so far? It's already going on since one and a half years. Yes, and we have had good results. Uh, first of all, talking about the technologies, there's a lot of technologies behind the scenes. There's uh, calculation methods, for example. A big thing is uh, computational flow field analysis, which is needed um, to, to, uh, to, to design a stack to the proper uh, pressure drop within the uh, in a stack to uh, avoid pressure losses, uh, to avoy avoid hot spots in such a sp uh, stack and thus degradation of components. Um, so uh, this was something we did focus uh, on very much in, 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 uh, to start off with. And we have had very good results in uh, enabling CFD um, calculation. And we apply this in, uh, to all our research stacks, but also to all our stacks that we are in production with already. So to, to the to components, uh, such as bipolar uh, plates or distribution fields, like they may be in frames, and uh, to the overall stack. Then we started off with uh, building a reference stack to have our first learnings, and that we could improve 
a lot, um, uh, resulting or having it tested at Fraunhofer Ease, uh, in, in resulting in very good, uh, let's say, state of the art um, uh, performance these days. And currently, we are pimping this stack to work at higher pressure. And in parallel, we are really now into the next generation. We're building something. We're developing something that will bring in to, to Fraunhofer uh, this fall or winter. Uh, that is really a new next generation something the world hasn't seen so far, I can tell you. But uh, uh, maybe I can show you next year <laughs> when <laughs> sitting here. Um, <laughs> But what a good instance Delivering. that we have Fraunhofer Easy here on stage. Yeah. So, Mr. Kopp, uh, um, uh, we have to say Fraunhofer Easy stands for Solar Energy System, Fraunhofer Institute for Solar Energy Systems. And despite its name, it's not only on solar, uh, but it's also in hydrogen and fuel cells, electrolyzers, uh, since uh, 1995. Uh, I know you are here an exhibitor here in the group exhibit since 1995. We've seen a lot of generations of electrolyzers. So how does the next generation will look like? What do you think? Um, so, so basically, the next generation would be the industrialized generation. Basically, the thing we're working together, ex for example, with Scheffler, um, to, to really get industrialized platforms there, um, to also get this manufacturing approach, which you usually have in electrolyzers at the moment, to, to get it to this more automatized production scale, and also um, yeah, get, get deeper analysis and understanding of the um, processes within the stack, as, as uh, Mr. Maya Petrov men um, mentioned, that we need to get an understanding of flow structures in there, of flow fields. Well, I, I can't really understand. Well, this is technology is 220 years old, and you still need to understand the flow structure. You know, and this should be clear since 50 years, uh, but it's not obviously. Ba basically, yeah, we're talking lots of uh, about PEM electrolyzers at the moment. It's a project where we're talking about is about PEM, PEM electrolyzers, and they're really the next generation electrolyzer stack is not only to understand but also to apply it to an industrial scale. Actually, that that's like. Um, we have a lot of knowledge. That's also basically a matter why, for example, Fraunhofer Easy, with this long experience in this field, um, is involved in such research projects to, to get this transformed to, to industrial production scale. So what, what I do understand is uh, to industrialize an electrolyzer stack is not just having a, a working stack and just uh, um, repeat it uh, several times, but this has to be designed differently. Exactly. Yeah, that, that, what we mentioned, you need to understand like the basics, and like you need to have a foundation of, of uh, experience of, of testing, and then you can basically scale up. So that's that's projects we, we supply for Stacy, for example. We do testing on Exito components. Exactly that we can do CFD models of flow field structures of PTL structures. Um, that we do, for example, uh, along the channel measurement. So basically, we have a small cell, which is a section of a stack, where we can understand different behaviors of um, current densities within this, this part. So basically, that's laying the foundation for getting this better understand, understanding of these larger stacks. Got it. And Dr. Eisenlohr, but maybe the next generation of electrolyzers will not be PEM electrolyzers anymore. It could be also AM electrolyzers. So please tell us what the Aeneon exchange membrane electrolyzers is exactly. Okay, yes. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for the invitation to speak here. And um, yes, what's the big difference? Actually, PEM and AEM electrolyzers are actually relatively similar in many aspects. But the major aspect reg regards the membrane, uh, because PEM electrolyzers have a proton exchange membrane. You have protons traveling through the membrane. On an AEM electrolyzer, we have OH minus ions traveling through the membrane. So, so we also have a polymer membrane, but we have another polarity going through this membrane. Now you say, OK, what's the big difference? Well, the big difference actually is twofold. One is. It allows us to operate in an alkaline environment. This alkaline environment is beneficial to the materials you're losing because there's materials are less, alkaline materials are less aggressive compared to acidic materials. And in PEM, by definition, you have H plus ions, which defines an acid. So you're working in a very acidic environment in PEM systems, which 
requires you to use titanium to avoid corrosion, things like this. This can be avoided in AEM. We can also use different catalysts, and catalysts which do not require iridium, which is also a big pinch point for, for PEM electrolyzer systems. So we like to say that we are actually taking... The best taking of two worlds, you could say. The yeah? best of two worlds, exactly. And uh, with that, we hope to, yeah, to hope to drive the economy forward because we, as other speakers here, especially the guy before us, we are on a mission to dry out the fossil fuel industry. I've seen on your website that you say, we will revolu uh, revolutionize how we will think, all think about energy. Our electrolyzers are the ideal solution to produce hydrogen gas from renewable energy. Where does this self-confidence uh, come from? Part of it, of course, is marketing. But <laughs> <laughs> on the other I hand, it, we have to, we, have to we, we, we really believe that we are onto something big. We have the technology, we have stacks available today, we are building hundreds a month. So I think from a pure number point of view, we are way ahead of a lot of our competitors. I mean, building hundreds a month, yeah, but ours are relatively small. So from a power point of view, you can say, okay, we're not producing that much. But if we want to talk about mass manufacturing in the future, of course, it makes a lot of sense to say, okay, we're already into the mass manufacturing, maybe not mass yet, But it, we will be, we will be able to produce very large numbers. Right now, as I said, we have a stack which has only a power of about 2.4 kilowatts. It gives you a kilogram a day. But uh, that is part of the H2 Giga project, is that we are putting many of these stacks together to make multi-cores where we can create bigger systems up to a megawatt. And uh, with these systems, we have this huge advantage of being able to to um, improve our systems very fast, very quickly, have high turnaround, and get into the mass manufacturing market. Mr. Cobb, short assessment about AEM. You're a PEM guy, of course. Uh, do, you, do you think AEM could be something or not? Just yes or no? No, definitely, definitely. It's like <laughs> AEM has still... No, definitely. That was a nice answer. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, AEM has, has still its weaknesses, all technology... Technologies have weaknesses in, in certain spots, um, but, but as, as you already said, AM really has the potential to be this um, best of two worlds. There, there is some issues, durability issues. Um, you still need to use KOH solution within the electrolyzer systems, which would be best to not have to deal with, with KOH solution. But um, yeah, we definitely see progress in UPTA is already manufacturing systems. They might not have the, the um, duration and, and lifetime of like PEM electrolyzers at the moment, but maybe also for AEM, it might not be required to have this long lifetimes because you use way cheaper materials. So with the lower production costs of AEM electrolyzers, you could maybe be able to just replace them more often. And actually, at the lifetime thing, it's very difficult to yeah. prove something is actually lasting for 30, 40, 50, 60,000 right. hours. I mean, yeah, look, years, uh, my, you know? my stack works for 60,000 hours. Okay, come back in 10 years to see <laughs> right. how, how is anybody going to prove that, right? So you always have to extrapolate. You have to come up with... I'm you know, pretty try sure to the accelerate scientist things. has so means to prove this, but uh, yeah. we don't go too much into that detail. No, but we will see. We will, <laughs> we see. will see indeed. <laughs> Dr. Kunta, anyway, uh, um, the H2 Giga project does not want to find out which uh, technology is the best. You say, yeah. well, it, all these technologies will have their place, right? Yes, yeah. definitely. H2 Giga is open for different electrolyzer uh, technologies, such as mentioned PEM, AEM, and alkaline and also high temperature electrolyzers. And we uh, strongly support in, in H2 Giga, we have 30 uh, projects um, and which independently of each other develop their technologies and scale up. And we have all the technologies of all the electrolyzers in H2 Giga. And we believe that every technology has its, uh, uh, its strengths and weaknesses. For example, if you take the PEM, it is very efficient and it's, it's very dynamic, but it's also a high cost technology. The alkaline is very mature. It doesn't need precious metal. And, uh, but it's maybe not that dyna dynamic, it's more for steady state. And the high temperature can, for example, use the energy of high temperature waste heat and be very efficient. So, so depending uh, where the electrolyzer uh, shell generates the hydrogen, uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, different technologies can be the best. 
But Dr. Kudler, what happens if uh, we will find in some part of the world, let's say in Australia, a complete new way of doing electrolysis? Uh, could you integrate that into your project, H2Giga, for the ne next generation yeah. of electrolysers? Yeah. Um, so in general, H2Giga is open for different technologies. And, and of course, this is not a decision of Dechema, um, but it's a decision of Project Trigger Jülich and the, and the ministry. And uh, however, we would support to get into contact. And uh, since H2Giga is, is not a basic research project, but it's a scale up project, I would uh, more see it than in the innovation pool and in the more, um, more academic projects. But of, of course, we, we are very open for uh, yeah, new ideas and new innovations. Uh, Mr. Cobb, you're, you're my scientist here in the round, so uh, I, mm -hmm. I didn't by instant say Australia because I've seen a quite interesting uh, electrolyzer in Australia, Hisata, a startup, and they say, well, the future will be mm -hmm. capillary fat electrolyzers. Uh, you probably have seen that, and what do you think about it? Actually, it's a very interesting idea. So, at first, this idea of having this um, competition between electrolyzer technologies to find like this best electrolyzer technology to rule them all will not really happen and it's actually not really helpful for our development. So I think at the moment we just need to look that we get an industry started and then we will see which technologies will fill in which niche. Um, for the mentioned mm -hmm. Hisata technology, for example, they mention a very high efficiency for their electrolyzer. Um, <clears throat> But they are on very low TRL levels, you have to admit. It's, it's like in a laboratory. It's, it's, it's a laboratory it? scale. Yeah. It's maybe small cells, but it's nothing that we will see in the next five years when, within like an industrial market, in, in my point of view, which doesn't mean that it's not an interesting concept, not an interesting idea. But on this road to really have like an industrialized, market-ready technology, there is quite many stepstones which you... Um, which you have to overcome, and, and we need to see what, what this technology will make out of this. Dr. Maya Petrov, um, I've seen you're working at the industrialization of electrolyzer stack production at the level of cell components and stacks. Is this the most promising field for you? You are a supplier, you know? You want to stay a supplier for electrolyzers as well? Why don't you build your own systems? Well, first of all, we are two but for testing, to test our own stacks and components. Second, uh, what uh, Scheffler can do very well, what we are renowned for is the industrial scale up into large numbers. When it comes to high technology, when it comes to high precision, precision when it comes to quality and that in large quantities. And that is what we are actually aiming for. And uh, if you uh, consider that a stack consists of multiple cells, let's say 100 cells, um, and we, just to give a number, produce maybe just 1,000 stacks a year, then we're looking at 100,000 components all alike of each type. So we are very quickly in a range where also the automotive business is really scaling up to large numbers, high precision, that then again justifies automation, uh, all these fields that, that um, H2Giga is aiming at, actually. I would like to give you the opportunity to ask your question. I have a look around. If there's any question, just raise your hand at any time. There's a gentleman in the first row. Please introduce yourself and then take your question. Uh, my name is uh, Hui. I'm from Invision Energy. We are one of the largest wind turbine producers. Uh, I have a question for e lepta as, uh, regarding the scaling up of electrolyzer. When you look at electrolyzers, most of the people look at the stack at a one megawatt, five megawatt, very large scale. And when we look at your products, your single stack are very small, right? When we scale up, we think that we're going to reduce the cost of labor and the materials. You actually make very small stacks, and you put very small stacks together to reach the kind of power. Mm -hmm. So how do you think you can reduce the cost, uh, reach the goal of cost by making a small stack and putting it together? This yeah. is something to me, skinning down, not scale up. Yeah. Thank yes. you very much for that question. Yes, yes. thank you uh, very much for the question. The, the our plan actually is to have a fully automated stack manufacturing. And uh, we have a model where 
a finish stack falls off the assembly line every 70 seconds, seven zero seconds. So one a minute, a little bit more than a minute for every stack, and at a very low cost. So in a euro per kilowatt on a stack cost point of view, on a stack only, we will be super duper competitive. Of course, if you have many stacks, you need more auxiliaries, more connections, more control systems. So that is something of a downside. So we will have to compensate those two. But um, for us, I mean, the, the, the sub, sub megawatt market is also a super interesting market because that is a market where many customers have applications today. I mean, there's many people who have a 100, 200 kilowatt PV on their roof and you can put it immediately into our systems. And, and, and it immediately, there's a business case, a positive business case. It, we don't need public funding for, for a 200 kilowatt project. That can, be, that, that can have a positive business case immediately. Of course, if we're talking about larger scale projects when it comes to wind turbines and things like this, um, there, is, there is definitely something for us in the future also if we grow our stacks. So that is something which will happen. But as we heard from this gentleman and from others, that of course is also a research topic. And, and if we want to promise 30,000 hours, 50,000 hours, 60,000 hours, it's not going to happen overnight. So we have our minimum viable product today, which works, which gives us good lifetimes, and with which we have to bank on the advantages we have, because if one stack fails, so what? I've got another 399 operating. So, so this type of thing is, is where we think we have a good leverage and we can exchange them on the fly and things like this. So, so that gives us some unique selling points also. Mr. Kopp, I would like to talk uh, yeah, a topic which is in discussion at the moment in the industry and also in research institutes. Um, the European politics <clears throat> are planning to abolish PFSA. That is fluorine. Uh, if you, they do that in the in the membranes, you got a big problem, don't you? Actually, we will. Yeah. To to, to answer it shortly, no. The, the trouble is, like, especially PEM technologies, PEM electrolyzers, PEM fuel cells. They're based on PFSA membranes, which incorporate fluorinated components w within their chemical structure. So basically, for for PEM business, this would pose severe risks for, for industrial development, to say so. There, there is research going on, obviously, on, on hydrocarbon membranes and other type of membranes where you get rid of fluorinated parts within the membrane itself, which is going on, but it's nothing that we will see within five years in industry. So basically, just from, from this industry startup perspective, which we have at the moment, you basically there is not that many alternatives, at least for PEM electrolyzers and PEM fuel cells to, to fluorinated parts. And this goes also like further for sealing technologies. You use sealings made out of FKM or something like this, which is also fluorinated polymers. That could also affect um, alkaline electrolyzer manufacturers. Um, you have, yeah, it, it's going even further. So uh, yeah, it's going even further. Fluorine <laughs> is not only in electrolyzer; it's also in, in Teflon plates. It is in my toothpaste. Uh, so a lot of things will change, but it would be the end for the European uh, electrolyzer industry, wouldn't it? Um, from from the PEM side, actually, it would be an end before we start at the moment. To to say that clear, like we will. We might be able to develop replacements for for fluorinated components, but especially within um, PEM devices, it's it's hard, and actually, it will um, stop the the safety of um, investment, the security of investment at the moment for for scale up. So companies will definitely not invest in production facilities for for PEM electrolyzers when they know that there will be a ban of these materials in five years. Yeah, I mean the whole point yeah. of using PFAS is because you want them to last a long time. Yeah. So, so it's kind of defeating the purpose if we say get rid of PFAS and then, of course, the, 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 the stacks will not function for as many hours as you want them to function. But, so, but we can close yeah. the loop, right? Sure. So yeah. we can recycle, we take it back everything and, and recycle it so we can keep the loop closed in contrast to some other applications which you were mentioning where there's an open cycle when it just gets thrown out into the atmosphere. We, we must 
making a closed cycle. So yeah. circular economy is especially in the field of electrolyzers and also fuel cells, uh, yeah, essential, I would say. Yeah. Is that maybe also uh, a message, Dr. Kundler, you can give back to the ministry? You know, they, they do this research work, yeah. they give the funding, also get some information back, what is really yeah. needed politically. Can you give that back to them? Yes, definitely. So I fully agree. Um, uh, in the case of, of banning the fluorinated membranes and the PEM technology, uh, the PEM technology uh, for the goals of 2030 would be just that. And, uh, and, and all the uh, uh, yeah, project funding and, and the, the policy uh, yeah, would, would be also useless. Then, so I, I strongly believe that we can um, uh, uh, we have a very good control of the membranes. And by the way, they are inherently connected with a very expensive catalyst. So I wouldn't dump them, to be honest, if there's iridium on, on the membrane. So this goes to recycling, and this is always in professional hands. And um, we, we strongly uh, support to make an exception. And I would like to point out that those membranes because of the harsh conditions in an electrolyzer or PEM fuel cell, they are really essential um, for, for the next 10 or 20 years. Dr. Mayer Petrov, um, circular economy is certainly very important and, and probably is part of your plans. Um, but anyway, isn't that also a bottleneck if you, if you look at the catalyst uh, on the membrane, the, the CCM, you just told me, uh, makes half the price of the whole stack, you know? Um, so, so isn't it, uh, couldn't that be a bottleneck that we do not have enough iridium and platinum uh, for the, all the catalysts that we need for the gigawatts and gigawatts that we need? Well, <coughs> it's uh, the, the uh, platinum group metals or precious metals are used as catalysts, but also as protective layers on bipolar plates, for example. So yes, it is an issue. And thus, as Mrs. Kundler just pointed out, we will have to have a closed, closed loop for recycling. But um, I stand here for the next generation uh, uh, stacks. And again, this is one key um, direction of development to reduce the amount of, uh, of such precious metals needed as well for catalysts, for being a catalyst or acting as a catalyst, as well as protective layers. And I can even tell you that we do have protective anti-corrosion layers on the anode side these days that do without precious metals. So there is a way forward and we can significantly re reduce the amount compared to the current status. Compared to the current status. This could grow up uh, quickly, uh, uh, Dr. Eisenlohr. I've heard the la latest uh, um, figures. We will need uh, 23 till th uh, 39 gigawatt until 2030, only in Germany, just to remind every one of us through North Stream 2 went only seven gigawatt. So it's, it's huge. It's, it's an amount you, you can't even really think of scaling up. How could a little startup like Enapta scale up that, that quick? Yes, I mean, if you have a normal company, you make a margin maybe 10% if you're good, maybe 15 if you're really good. And then you invest this to grow your company. But clearly, if you are scaling to go twice or three times every year for the next 10 years to make this target, you are looking to get external financing for this period of time, at least for the next few years. So, so that is something which is, is um, on the table. We have to, I mean, we can take on projects. Each individual project makes its money. But of course, if I have a turnover of 50 million this year, and I want to do 100 million this year, I have to start buying so much material to make this material for next year, that I'm going to need some cash up front to make this happen. So this is kind of the, the, the vicious circle we are in. And if we really want to grow the hydrogen economy, that is something we're going to have to crack open, wide open. And uh, uh, one of the colleagues here, the, the, the guy who was here before, who said, Maybe there should be a, a larger CO2 tax to start financing this type of thing. Maybe that is a solution, but that is for the politicians to decide. But we are always looking for additional capital. But 
I would like to point one thing out here. We are here talking about hydrogen, but hydrogen is only part of the game. Yeah. We do need the renewable, the green energy or electricity, in, in fact, uh, to, to produce this hydrogen. So we need right. the scale up with wind power turbines, with solar energy just as well and as much and or even more. more. Raw materials are needed for that uh, mm -hmm. again. Yeah, so it's a, it's a huge uh, task that in front of us. But in terms of science, Dr. Kopp, um, is, is there, uh, are we ahead, you know, uh, worldwide or is China leading or the Uni United States leading or is Germany well, the number one in, in science for electrolyzers? Um, I think it's depending, actually. In Germany, we, we have quite a, a good base and foundation for, for research. So we have many institutions that actually not, not only Fraunhofer Easy, but, but, but also other institutions that work on hydrogen technologies and electrolyzers already for 20, 30 years. So it's a really long time span. Um, in the US, we also have large research facilities. They're also ahead. They, they now have like huge fundings due to the Inflation Reduction Act over there. So basically, that will definitely give a boost where we really need to, to see that, that we get along with. Um, but, but yeah, China and, and other countries are also coming up front. Japan is, is for a long time in the, in the hydrogen business with, with excellent research institutions. So I think it's a worldwide phenomenon. We, we so, cannot so you think it will happen the same story again, like photovoltaic, we are developing it and uh, then China will produce it. Uh, we, should, we should try not, not to do it in, as Europe. Like we, we basically, in China also, uh, hydrogen will be required, so there will be also domestic markets. In, in Europe, hydrogen will be required, but we should definitely not repeat mistakes that we build up infrastructure, that we build up production capacities, and then basically let it die, to say so. That, that would be like a huge issue. So the, the security for, of investment is, is really a key at the moment. So companies will only invest in here if there's a, like safe environment, a secure environment to invest and, and build up uh, production capacity. We're coming to the end of our discussion here, but uh, one uh, important point is digitization uh, is always an important uh, aspect in industry uh, and also for the next generation of electrolyzers. Some of your projects, uh, Dr. Kundler, are dealing with a digital twin of electrolyzers to create a landscape of the different existing di digital twins. There's a survey going on right now. H can you tell us how to participate in this survey? Uh, yes, we have in the innovation pool two projects, two h 3 g projects who work on digital technologies and how to describe the electrolyzer and the plant and also the industrial projects work on this. But these two projects together with Dechema, our booth is over there, this direction. Um, uh, we have a barcode there. You uh, um, are warmly invited to visit our booth, scan the barcode or visit our LinkedIn channel, h 2 giga at LinkedIn. There you also find the barcode on the information and we would be very interested to g gain information, to get different perspectives um, about the input into the digital twins and how they describe the electrolyzer or the plant over lifetime. Very good. So you're becoming part of the H2Giga project by participating yeah. in this survey. I would like yeah. to thank you all for being here on stage, uh, dear panel. It was a pleasure talking to you, and it was a pleasure to have you here, dear audience. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.